Hello, H Civil War subscribers, and welcome back to another episode of the Civil War Era in Digital Humanities. After a brief pause, we're finally back this month with a new episode. In this episode, I spoke with Damien Shields about his website, IrishAmericanCivilWar.com. Damien is a historian and archaeologist based in Ireland. He is the author of two books on the Irish experience during the Civil War, the first being The Irish in the American Civil War, published in 2014, and his most recent publication, The Forgotten Irish, Irish Immigrant Experiences in America, published in 2016. Currently, Damien is in the process of completing his PhD research at North Umbria University, which focuses on analysis of the correspondence of Irish servicemen contained within 19th century American widows and dependent pigeon files, which is based on a major database of Civil War letters he created. Damien's website, irishamericancivilwar.com, uh, was founded in 2010, and it focuses on the Irish immigrant experience in the 19th century United States and the Irish in the American Civil War. In particular, the website offers a detailed look into the lives of individual immigrant families to explore wider aspects of Irish immigration and Irish Civil War service. So without further delay, here's my conversation with Damien Shields. I hope you all enjoy. All right, Damien, well, thank you so much for joining uh, HDET Civil War today to talk about your website, Irish American Civil War. Thank, thanks for the invite, Chase, appreciate it. Um, so to get started, um, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, how your website got started, kind of what drew you to um, making an entire website devoted to kind of the, the Irish, Irish American experience during the Civil War. I know from the about page on your website that this, op that this website's been in, uh, it's been up and running for about 10 years. Uh, I think it said mm -hmm. it started around 2010. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I suppose back in back almost in the heyday of blogging, then um, blog blogging is kind of in an interesting place just at the moment. But the the um, yeah, I suppose it kind of feeds back into my career. So um, I'm worked in museums for quite a bit, and I'm an archaeologist, and tend to work. Most of my career has been kind of spent looking at military and 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 um, social military history and things like that. But I was working on a major exhibition for our National Museum of Ireland, which was exploring the military history and one of the galleries I was responsible for was the American gallery and when I was doing that gallery I was obviously doing the American Civil War but I always had an interest in the Civil War and so when I started reading about it I was going wow it's incredible the lack of understanding in Ireland there is of the scale of Irish involvement in the conflict um, and then it, it effectively went down to, I, I tend not to be very good at just not doing anything. And then one weekend in 2010, I went, you know, God, I wonder should I just set up a blog and I could just explore a few stories about different Irish units and stuff. Um, and then that was maybe the, the best or worst decision in my life, depending on how you look at it. Um, and we're now, we're now um, 11 years on, but um, I, I try and, I try and add significant new content every month if I can. And, and it, it kind of, it, grew from there it started off as a very basic site like looking at kind of the type of things you'd expect you know the Irish Brigade at Fredericksburg kind of very basic stuff but it it shifted a bit I suppose and um, we built up a bit of, of a community around it now but it, it kind of it's almost become an amalgam site of looking at the Irish experience but looking at it as well in what looking at the American Civil War records and everything you tell us about Irish immigration and everything as well so I mean and a lot of the work that I do now I suppose 80% of the posts on the site relate to pension file work and, and looking at that sort of analysis. A lot of it is anyway, the individual posts. So that was kind of the genesis of it. Um, and it, it's kind of grown into, into that and become a kind of a, a bigger campaign in Ireland to try and get, get more attention on it. Um, and just, it's such an endlessly fascinating topic. I've never been able to put it down since. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> One of the things I think when you visit the the website that's striking is the sheer amount of content on the website. I mean, it's truly, I I mean, you can get lost, you know, in an entire day just going <laughs> to the different tabs and all the different content. But I think what's really interesting is kind of you have this large amount of content and you kind of present like a, almost like a synthesis and overview in a way in so, at some, in some points of, of the Irish American experience in the Civil War. But you also devote a lot of the web page to focusing kind of like on individual families and individuals. So right, kind of balancing 
this kind of like larger story. There's also smaller stories. So I just, could you talk a little bit about that and kind of how that is, is really kind of, I think is a, is a major element of the web page. Yeah, it is. And I, I, I like, I like using that. I mean, that, that you hear that term micro history. I, I like looking at the micro history of these families um, and, and seeing what you can tell from a broader perspective on it. So, I mean, there's a lot, there, there's a lot of focus on things like the Irish Brigade and everything. And I actually think, I mean, the Irish Brigade are an incredible, um, the interest in formation incredibly important, undeniably the most important formation. I think, in fact, you could argue that maybe interest in the Irish, has, the, the, the focus on the Irish has suffered a bit because the Irish Brigade are so all encompassing. Um, and one of the things I, I like to try and do with the micro histories is show, well, number one, that's the minority experience. The, the, it, the Irish Brigade at Fredericksburg is not the Irish American experience of the Civil War because most of them don't fight in those sort of units. Um, so it's trying to look at how, you know, you can look at all sorts of things, how they interact in mixed units, which is where most of them fight. You can, you can see, you know, when you're looking at things like pension files, that, that two or three Irish Americans might be coalescing in a company where, where they're the only Irish Americans. Uh, and you can look then, if you're looking at a company that's filled with Irish Americans, about how they're trying to express their Irish ethnicity in, in a broader sense. So you've got this full range of, of everything you can look at. The social aspect is the huge thing for me, and, and particularly the, the fact that they're the base layer of people. So most of, most of what I look at in the site is the, is the working class, often the underclass of the Irish Americans. Because even in general Irish, generally examining the Irish Americans in the war, most of what we're hearing are middle class Irish. The, a lot of the senior officers and everything, that's whose records are left. Uh, I like to get at these people who are who are just under that level and, and explore them. There's a flip side to it in terms of Irish immigration as well, and this isn't often really understood, and it's not well enough understood in Ireland. Um, Ireland doesn't have very good records for the 19th century, um, social records. So the records created for the American Civil War are actually the best records relating to Irish people in the 19th century that exist anywhere in the planet, including Ireland. So it, it gives us a unique opportunity to look at the ordinary lives of women and children and everything in that period because of the records the Civil War create. So, yeah, I mean, there's a whole range from that individual family to focusing on, on experiences within, like, units and then building it up, you know, to look at, to look at things like the Irish experience. You can, you can start looking at things like the Irish and the regulars, all of this sort of stuff that just builds on the, 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 um, the kind of the individual story at the, at the very bottom. And I'm a great believer that you can tell a, a much wider story by looking at individual families and, and groups of people interacting at that level. And, and it builds to wider questions. So, I mean, one of the big ones on the, uh, on the site has been in relation to how many Irish Americans actually served in the war, which became a, a fairly big focus. Um, and and that, I suppose that's one of, the, one of the things, one of the main things that I think has come out of the work on the site is, is that there actually has been a, a fairly significant underestimation of the number of Irish Americans who served in the war um, from, from what we thought. Um, so it's just given me a, an opportunity to go down lots of different rabbit holes as well, <laughs> like that, like things like numbers, like interactions with African Americans, all, all of that sort of stuff um, over the course of a decade of looking at these different people. It just brings more and more questions for us to answer. And so you talk, you mentioned that a, a lot of the 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 documents that you use to kind of compose some of these profiles that you see, like we'll talk about the interactive maps a little bit later, but you click on those and it'll show like a profile of the person, you know, mm. where they died, where they're from. Uh, you say, you know, pension files are, are one of your big sources, but yeah. what other types of sources do you kind of, you know, use to compose those profiles? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I noticed that also in a way there's a, I don't know if crowdsource is the right element, but like there's people who will, you know, donate documents or something like that to help you yeah. kind of compose these profiles also. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I suppose it's one of the big things about when I started a site, because I'm talking to you now from the shores of Cork Harbour on the south coast of Ireland. So I have no access to archives. Um, it's something that I've had to um, unfortunately except is that I do not have direct access um, to, to any of, of the major archives of the Civil War. So I suppose when I went back, that's why I started looking initially at 
widows and dependent pension files is because some of them have been digitized. So most of the other sort, I suppose I, I have it down to a fine art now in, in terms of subscriptions and, and looking for things. So I would tend to do an awful lot of work trying to tie individuals to other, other documents that are accessible to me. So things like the census would be a major thing. Um, often then looking at digitized, it, it, all the way through things like, you know, um, the, the, the national homes, all of those type of records would, I would use a lot. I would make an awful lot of use of things like, you know, the, the county histories that you would get that often discuss civil war units from a particular part of a particular state in, in fine detail. Those sort of histories I would, I would frequently be using regimental histories that are available. So I tend to just start start in close and then just, just look at muster rolls, everything I can get my hands on. Um, so I have some from research trips to the States then, some, some other records. But yeah, as you point out, I, su I suppose one of the great things about the site is that this really substantial community is built up around it now. And, and some of them in fact contribute uh, as patrons towards the, the running of the site because Otherwise, I couldn't keep it running um, because of the cost. So, so the, uh, and I just get, you know, donations about individual stories. People give me their family histories of research they've done. You get images sent through. I remember one great one I got where I'd been working on a pension file of an Irish guy who had died at Cold Harbour. And the letter that had been sent, it was in the pension file that his wife had sent in to get the pension, had been cut from the pocket of his uniform um, three days after. The, the battle as his body was being cleared and um, with a note written on it by, by the officer who had found the body, <clears throat> excuse me, and posted that information. And the family subsequently saw that and had photos of both he and his wife that they sent to me. Um, the greatest one actually, the greatest one, um, and this is probably, I could talk about this topic all day, the, the, the contributions you get from the site, but I had worked, it's probably my favorites story it's one of the most poignant it actually one featured in my last book it's it's about a young limerick immigrant from troy new york who had um, a mental disability and was stolen from a um, an institution in troy and sold into the union army and his mother a woman called Catherine garvin um, spent um, a number of years trying to find him she actually went down to the army um, everybody got to know her. Uh, most of the generals got to know her. Lincoln became involved in the case. It was quite a big case at the time. And I I come across that pension file and done a significant amount of the background work and done things like looking at the newspapers and everything to get it. Um, and Catherine Garvin had been famous. She was an illiterate immigrant, had been become famous for carrying a bunch of documents around her neck, which were all the passes that she had and information that related to her son that she carried around the army. And... Um, she had actually come back to Ireland after the war. Um, and I was able to trace these documents through the 19, through to, to about the 1960s, when somebody actually in County Cork, where I am now, was seeking to sell these documents back to America. And so I'd done a huge amount of work on this story and, and the trail had gone dead there. And I was wondering, did they ever go back to America? Um, or, um, but uh, anyway, I just, I had written a piece on the site for it. And just as I was finalizing the text for the book, um, I got a I got a notification that um, one of the um, institutions that has Lincoln material had been digitizing some of their their documents um, um, in Illinois and uh, had been uh, had been going through it and found these documents and they put in a search because it related to Catherine Garvin um, and, it, and it transpired that they had all these documents that had they had been bought by a Lincoln collector and then they had had taken them into their collection a couple of decades later and they digitized they prioritized the digitization of the whole collection so that i could access it for the book so you know that's the type of you, you just can't you, you just you can't put a price on that sort of contribution so so yeah it's it's been phenomenal for that like the the amount of of information that's been passed through and even within an irish context even people who came back to ireland um so a few families who, who would um, pass on books or diaries and things that, that of the very, very few who actually came back to Ireland. So it's uh, been fantastic for that. And it, it just makes me think that, you know, this is not a website. I mean, it, it is obviously the, the primary theme is Irish Americans in the Civil War, but in a sense, 
you, you get a feel for like the entire diaspora, right? Because I mean, <laughs> you can see the documents, you can see the movement back and forth. So, you know, I think there's, there's just so much going on with this website that's not even necessarily related to the Civil War. Yeah. <clears throat> well, like I think the, the, big, the biggest thing probably, and it, I mean, the title is a bit deceptive. You're right in that, in, in that respect. A huge amount of the site, I suppose, is, is almost dedicated to Irish, the history of Irish women in the 19th century, uh, largely because that's what I'm doing a lot of my work is focusing on. But you're getting these women are, are illiterate women. Are, you're getting first person accounts of them. You're seeing the impact of terribly hard lives on a lot of these people. I mean, that, that would be the thing, I suppose, the most, apart from the fact nearly everybody I work on lost somebody as a result of the Civil War, which is bad enough. But, you know, you're seeing things like people who have lost people during the Great Famine in Ireland. So you're seeing that linkage. It's a big disconnect in Ireland. Uh, so, so in Irish history, the famine is obviously a major event, um, a very major event. Um, but we have a tendency here to say, well, and then they all emigrated. You know? So we have a million people leave. And so the story is, is it's, it's improving, but the story often isn't followed to the extent that it, 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 it should be. And these files are allowing us to, to follow that story. So we're seeing people then move into the States and becoming embroiled. It, it caused me to, I often refer to the Civil War as the second great trauma in their lives because so many of these people had experienced the famine. So you see this, you know, guys who are going out fighting in Bull Run and fighting in Gettysburg, whose father died in 1847, the worst year of the famine. Um, and they're going out under the eldest son or whatever, and, and they're getting killed there. So it kind of, gives you that sense of, 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 of what's happening, the, the hardship in their lives. You see an awful lot of the, you know, the, the, the dark history, things like the, the impact of alcohol on these communities is absolutely incredible. Um, the impact of violence, of um, just general hardship. So yeah, you're getting that full, you're getting that full range. It has to be said now, the widows and dependent pension files are not the files to be looking at if you're wanting the, the success stories of emigration because they're rarely in there. Um, so occasionally I, occasionally I try and mix it up a bit to have a bit more light um, content as well. But they are just so, it's so rich just to be able to access what these women were experiencing. And you're seeing how they're interacting with Ireland, the chain migration. So that's a very big thing that comes out of looking at the Civil War. You see in, in real action, how um, where I'm sitting here, people in a four, five, 10 mile radius are emigrating over the course of 10, 20, 30 years and they're going to the same areas um, as chain migrants, that they are staying in touch with both the people that they know from, from their locality in Ireland, but they're staying in touch with Ireland as well across 20, 30, 40 years. Because a lot of these emigrants are required um, as part of the deal when they emigrate to send money back to the people who haven't been able to emigrate in Ireland. And so you're seeing all those ties, all because somebody went into uniform in 1861 or 1862 or whatever it is. So it's an, an incredible link because of that conflict. And I'm glad you brought up dark history and kind of mentioned, you know, the trauma that uh, a lot of these immigrants experience. One of the, um, I guess one of the features of the website is a is just basically a whole separate project that you can access via the website dedicated to the Irish experience at Andersonville, the infamous yeah. prison in Georgia. So could you talk a little bit about kind of what that project's about and then kind of what's available to uh, users who kind of visit that part of the website? Yeah, no problem. So it had been a project I'd wanted to do for a long time, um, mainly because I kept coming across it so so regularly. So, so like, you know, I'm dealing with guys who die in the war um, and we often think, you know, and particularly if you're not a scholar of the Civil War, scholars of the Civil War or, or, or buffs about the Civil War um, tend to notice, but people think that Gettysburg or Antietam are the place where most people die. Uh, and, you know, you come across those, those, those places frequently, but nowhere matches Andersonville, nowhere matches it. Um, and it, it's, um, so the scale of it had always, interested me because so many Irish died there. Um, there's also the, the flip side about because, because it was in operation, the time it was in operation in the war, there's almost a higher chance that there are Irish Americans there because there were quite substantial 
enlistments when financial inducements became kind of the, the, the main reason people were enlisting. A lot of Irish Americans are enlisting in that time and then getting captured or, or um, deserting occasionally and, and getting captured as a result. And so they're going there. Um, and I had seen it on work I'd been doing, looking at people who had been paying, who had been receiving pension files in, uh, receiving American pension payments in Europe after the war. I had seen that Andersonville overwhelmingly dominates the reason people are getting pension payments, so mothers and widows throughout Europe, not just in Ireland. Uh, and I had, over the years, been gathering a bit of data when I used to come across um, guys, and I, I had, was up at about 90 or, or 100 of these fellas at the time. Um, and finally, uh, with a, with a, um, a, a friend, um, Professor Nicholas Allen, uh, at the University of Georgia, was very encouraging in saying that we really have to um, try and, and move things forward here to try and get the Irish um, recognized from an Irish perspective, the number of them who are buried at Andersonville. And also, it's just such a, a phenomenal opportunity to look at this broad swathe, effectively to pick out a, a study group of Irish and just dealing then with the guys who are at Andersonville. So um, it was conceived as a crowd crowdsourced project. So the idea is um, that people can contribute. So there's a, 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 an email, andersonvilleirish at gmail.com set up. So people can contribute any individuals that they know who were either born in Ireland or whose parents were Irish. That's how I define Irish American um, in the context of the Civil War era. So, you know, a lot of the guys that we would call English or Canadian or Scottish in the American Civil War are actually ethnic Irish because of step migration. So, uh, and American born as well, obviously. So the, looking at all them and so people can contribute. So what we've got so far is a lot of people who maybe have studied a regiment in detail, gone through. Uh, so people who've looked say at the Plymouth Pilgrims in detail have been contributing the Irish that they know of. Um, some fantastic individual family stories again. So, you know, people who have two or three generations of kind of researching their Andersonville ancestor um, really incredible stories and often they've gone on their own personal pilgrimages and like I'm getting sent photos from 20, 30, 40 years ago of family pilgrimages to Andersonville. Um, and so the, I suppose the two components that are available if people go to the page are a, a, a monthly update of a database. So the database is listing all of these individuals in the unit they served in. So on their last update, we were at 225 individuals. So I'll be doing the February update later in the month. I have a lot, a lot of people to add to that. Um, and the other element, so there's that, that database, which is freely available. The other element that I'm putting up is something that I, I, I think is a really good tool for getting people to realize, particularly in an Irish context, the scale of service. And you'll know yourself, people are never more interested in something than if they know it happened a mile or two down the road from them or if they can locate it precisely. Um, so one of the big problems in, in, in relation to the Irish to the Civil War is that they very rarely say where they're from. Um, there, there's a, it's, it's a different topic, but a lot of Irish in the Civil War are actually recorded as American born in their enlistment. Into the, I'm talking here into the federal military. Um, where they are recorded as Irish, it tends to just be Ireland. So um, I've had a number of things going to try and locate people tighter than that. And so the other big element of the Andersonville Irish is a map of Ireland with all of the guys who have been located either to a county level or to their precise location, plotted on it. So, I mean, a, a really good example of this was, was one contribution I got of a Plymouth Pilgrim. Um, I was only doing the work about three weeks ago. And on very rare occasions, I can actually tie the American records to the Irish records. Um, the Irish records are partially incomplete because a lot of them were destroyed during the Irish Civil War, the 20th century, but the, um, the records were, were and this guy's name and his records made it possible for me to identify the house that he was almost certainly born in, in this very rural part of Ulster, where there is a ruined cottage sitting in this field up the side of a mountain. And so now it's allowing us to, to trace this man all the way from there to a grave in Georgia where he dies in 1864. So that's the, the power of that. So they're the, two, they're the two kind of major things, the database, and the um, and the map of Ireland. There, that's it. That's that's the two kind of principal elements of that, that project. Yeah, and here you mentioned that kind of this is a different topic, but I mean, what's the explanation for why you know 
uh, some of these guys are identified as American or English? Is it is it is it the nativist sentiments that they're afraid of discrimination? What what's the, <clears throat> the rationale? It, there's there's a lot of different there's a lot of different reasons for it. Um, like one of the big problems currently, and it, it goes back to the numbers. So the, I, I, the num I was mentioning earlier, the numbers of the Irish are underestimated. Um, nativity is used too much generally for us as a delineator. Like it can work for some <clears throat> groups. It can work for, for a lot of the German groups, for example. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, it doesn't work for the Irish um, to the same extent because they didn't. Um, th there's a lot of Irish groups who are spending 20, 30 years in Britain or Canada before they come to America. Um, and those people, and we see it in the way they write, identify themselves as ethnic Irish. It doesn't mean that they don't identify themselves as American as well when they're in America. Um, that's, a, that's a much bigger discussion. But uh, they see themselves as ethnic Irish. Um, in terms of the actual recording of people, um, it's, it's something that during my own research I've seen again and again and again, this, the, the guy's being put down as American. Um, and there, there seems to be two reasons for it. Particularly later in the war, there was a bit of a habit of saying, oh, this guy is, they would just record, you know, when there were bounties going, big bounties to pull guys into different towns and cities across the north. Some of the, the, um, the local recruiters seem to have been a bit reticent to think that there were a bunch of Irish lads at church <laughs> kind of coming along from New York City and that they would record them as, a, as local. Um, you also have um, issues where I think some of the officers are probably not recording them properly as Irish. Um, but then there is, I think, an argument to be made that some of the younger, younger fellas, say if you're, if you're, if you've got an American accent, say you've been born in Ireland and you have an American accent, I think there's an argument to be made, it's very difficult to prove this, there's an argument to be made that some of them have an identity that they, they, they see as a bit more malleable, depending on the situation, because nativism is a fairly significant issue. I come across guys who changed their name um, in the military because they don't want to be called Paddy in service. So, so like the, you have you have that element of it as well. Um, but it, 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 it's an interesting dynamic. It seems to be more prevalent in the navy than the army. Lots and lots of guys in the navy who were recorded as American-born. Some of them recent immigrants. I have guys off the boat. In, from, they came over as adults in 1857, 1858, recorded as from New York when they, they joined the navy. Um, so, so there's there's something very wide at play. I I think you can probably question um, some of the the numbers coming out of certain states. Massachusetts has uh, it, it, when analysis is done after the war by the Sanitary Commission, they they kind of put a fairly low level of Irish in proportion to the number in the state. I I the evidence that comes out of looking at Massachusetts units doesn't seem to bear that out. So I think there, there might even be some nativist sentiment in the willingness to say how many Irish there are in the Union military after the war. Because obviously, as we know, it, it had been a regular um, issue leveled at the North by, by the Confederacy during the war, that they were just a, an army made up of, of immigrant mercenaries. Um, I, think, I think there's a bit of a level of embarrassment later in the war um, as well that, you know, the, the immigrants appear in many cases to be more willing to enlist, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1864, 1865, than, than native born um, who haven't served up to that juncture. So yeah, there's an awful lot at play, but the, the ultimate, the ultimate um, result of it is, is that the numbers are suppressed. So we'll never know the exact number, but they're certainly higher than, than, than what we've got figures for, if that makes sense. Um, getting back to, Anderson deal here. Hmm. Um, do you have records? You know, I mean, you know, guys at Andersonville, you know, wrote recollections of their experience there, what paper they had. I mean, do you have documents that uh, uh, users can interact with, can read on the website that, you know, <coughs> tell you, you know, kind of the experience of some of these Irish prisoners at Andersonville, what they saw, you know, what, what it was like for them there? Not not quite yet, but kind of, I suppose you would say. The, the, um, that's part of the plan is to do that. Um, but what the site does have is one of the other resources is a bibliography of, of all of the works. It has to be updated. I haven't updated in about the last 12 months. All of the known publications 
relating to the Irish in the Civil War. So wherever there's, some of them relate to Andersonville. So wherever there's a link. So Michael Doherty, a Medal of Honor recipient from Donegal, who was held in Andersonville um, in 13 Pennsylvania Cavalry. His memoirs, for example, are part of that. Um, and there's a couple of individual posts related to the Andersonville Irish to talk about his experiences there um, and his often wildly inaccurate um, accounts, it must be said, of his experience in Andersonville. But the, um, so people can access that and on the bibliography page, anything that is freely accessible, which is an awful lot, as you know, of 19th century memoirs, um, there's a link to it so, so you, can, you can examine it. Um, some of the other stuff, so there's letters that I've come across written by people, so they're up on online in some of the posts on the site, and that, that's something I'll be adding to as well. Um, so some of these guys are writing out of Andersonville when they first arrived there. Um, there's a very, uh, there's a, a priest who's in Andersonville working, um, uh, he's based in the Confederacy, who becomes quite well known, Father Peter Whelan. He becomes known as the Angel of Andersonville, so there's a letter that he's written, for example, uh, passing on news of the death of one of the soldiers. So people can kind of dive into that. And that's, that's going to be the longer term project. Um, so when people have handed all this in, so there's that interactive element to the database and of the map, the idea is, is that there's a consistent picture building up, this mass resource of identifiable Irish Americans within the camp. And so the idea is to look at all of those men to see what they tell us about Irish America in the 19th century in, in very much the same way as we were discussing earlier, you know, what's it telling us about their families and their experiences, why they're coming, but then looking very much at their military experience as well, why they're enlisting, when they're enlisting, and then their experience in Andersonville is something that really interests me. I'm very interested in seeing about the interactions of Irish Americans with each other, with other men in their unit, and with the, with the broader with the broader prison population. Um, because the Irish have a reputation as being the roughs, the rowdies in the, in the Northern military. The Andersonville Raiders have a distinctly Irish and Irish American component to them. The Andersonville Raiders who were executed there for, for um, crimes against their fellow prisoners. There's statistical work that's been done that shows that the Irish stuck together in Andersonville. Um, so there's a huge amount of really interesting little, little paths that we can take to explore both wider 19th century Irish America and then the military experience of these men um, through the project. So that's the kind of wider aims once we've, we've got a long way down the road of, of the submissions. Right. It's, um, like I said, there's just mountains of information you know, <laughs> with this. And I, I should mention that when you look on the... Um, the Andersonville page, there's all a bunch, of, there's a lot of supplementary material like blog posts, et cetera, that you, yeah. can, you can pour through to get more context. Um, um, so in addition to the, the Andersonville project, you also have another project. I mean, there's several projects, but one of the, <laughs> one of the uh, other projects I think is really interesting is you have this uh, mapping veterans uh, project on the page that looks at the uh, Donegal veterans who fall. Mm. Them, right. So, yeah. yeah, if you just talk a little bit about what that project focuses on and again, kind of what for users who look at the page, what they'll kind of see when they visit. The yeah, page. yeah, no problem. So, so, so that had a, a similar, um, if you like, genesis to the Andersonville one in that uh, whenever I come across guys with really good locationary information to Ireland, I, I tend to record them. Um, so I've been doing that for about a decade. Um, and uh, I'm not from Donegal myself, but I have family connections to Donegal, which is the most northwesterly, it's the most northerly county in Ireland. It's up in the northwest of the island um, and had a lot of immigration, particularly to, to Pennsylvania um, during the 19th century. Um, and so I bought, the reason it starts in Donegal is because of my, uh, my, personal, <laughs> my personal links to the place. Um, and again, it, it followed on from that idea of trying to link these people. It just makes it much more of a, of, a, of, a, of a real, of a visceral thing if you can go, we know all these people are there. And again, it's got utility for everyone, but it was primarily created for an Irish audience, if you like. It was, they, they were the people I was attempting to convert on this great pilgrimage I'm on with the site. Um, but it, it, it's... Uh, um, the idea is to try and provide 
locationally evidence for the guys as close as possible to their home localities and then to provide the information about their life. So they've got, it's more extensive, the biographies on that site than, than say on the Anderson for Irish site. It's got a bit about their family connections. And in, in some cases, it's about the children of people who are from a location. So the idea is that um, that will grow to include the entire island. And I have to say, it's been a very interesting project in terms of the response it has got in Ireland is, is quite incredible. So when I launched that project initially on the site, all the local radio stations in that part of Donegal wanted to, to discuss it. Um, there's been a given number of talks in Donegal about, about different elements there. Um, one, in, one, in fact, actually is, is a guy, an, in, an incredible story of a guy who, who, who survived Andersonville. He was captured at Chickamauga. And he was an Illinois infantryman. Um, he's one of the lads on it. And he comes from a tiny, small, off, off the coast island off Donegal called Aranmore Island. And this man returned to his local community. And I worked with the local community there to tell this, this man's story. We got the boat out to the island and gave a lecture on him, visited the house that he died in and everything. This, this man never recovered from what Andersonville had done to him. So like, I mean, it just happened. Uh, standing there on this tiny island looking out over cliffs across the Atlantic and you're thinking about Anderson. <laughs> so everything ties in. It's quite, quite remarkable. Um, but the, the, the other difference about that, I suppose, is that it includes both, both sides of the story as well. So there are Confederate Irish included in that map too. Um, so there, there's, you know, some very interested individuals there um, who, who had, you know, there's a guy who has a monument to him set up by his brother, his brothers on the Chickamauga battlefields. Um, he was in the first Tennessee um, and was killed there. So, and they, they went and visited after, after the battle and they put up a kind of a personal memorial that's still there to him. So you have all of, all of those type of elements and it links again things to if there's a house that's known, if I've been able to identify, and in that man's case, I was able to identify the house he was born in, sort of image of the house. So again, it just ties all of that, that linkage across the Atlantic. Um, and, and again, you've got guys who've come back. So some of the guys who are, who are on that page are men who returned to Donegal after the war and lived there who claim pensions. Some of them are widows who claim pensions. Um, and, and it just allows people to kind of dive in. And I consistently get additions to it, you know, because people who are doing their family history, I've, I got an addition to that map two days ago that I have to input. So my, my hope is to just start spreading it because anytime I ever do any work, and as I get asked, when are you doing Sligo or Leitrim or Galway or Dublin? <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, obviously it takes a significant, um, significant amount of time to do it. Needless to say, I just do all of these things off my own bat, really. <laughs> it's, I should get a bit more organized in relation to getting funding and things for them. But, uh, yeah, so that, that's the genesis of that. And that will eventually become an all-island map. Yeah, it's, you know... Um... It's really interesting map too because of the pins. When you click on them, you get these very detailed profiles of some of these some of these guys. I was flipping through it before we came on today, and there was one I forget the, the man's name, but it was a guy who was captured. He was paroled. He was in the army. He was captured, paroled, and when he 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 changed his name and re-enlisted into the navy. Mm. And I guess that's just because he didn't. He was just like I I'd rather do something different than you know what I was doing before or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, that, it's a big, and it's going to be, um, I was actually having a conversation about this a couple of days ago. It's going to be an offshoot. I'm actually gathering information for an article on it. One of the really, really interesting things about uh, both that project and the Andersonville project and generally looking at Irish Americans when you're, or, or any group really, um, working class group, when you're dealing particularly with the, the Northern documents, because the Northern documents are so good, um, is, is the use of aliases, the frequency of their use and the reasons people are using them. Um, because people, to get the pension, have got to say, why did you say, or why did your husband say that his name was John Gallagher when his name was Martin Friel? Um, so obviously to get the money, you have to explain that some way. Now you might lie about it, but... Um, I think a lot of them are telling the truth. And that's where you get the, this information. So that I was mentioning the man earlier on who, who changed his name um, from Patrick because he didn't want to be called Paddy. He, he said he'd been working in a workshop. The family said he'd been working in a workshop with um, a bunch of English 
and Americans who kept calling him Paddy and he didn't want to be called that anymore and so he changed his name. A lot of the time it's because they wanted dessert or they want the option. I think a lot of them don't trust the authorities um, and they want the option of, of being able to go. Um, and, and some of them um, are doing it for other reasons. Like, you know, I have a guy who, who does it because his father was a violent drunk and he didn't want to use his surname. So you see things emerge with guys like that, actually, in, in that there's, there's an almost, it would be the majority of men I've come across. There's a kind of a, a rule that they don't tend to follow in terms of alias use, and it's nearly always their mother's maiden name. They nearly always use it. It is their first preference of what they go for. It's just one of those interesting things that kind of emerges out when you're diving into those guys is this is this these sort of stories that you don't kind of think about too much. We always think about aliases straight away thinking, oh, that's some sort of ne'er do well who's just looking to kind of mess around with everyone, but not always the case. So yeah, just a, it's an interesting aside from them. Um yeah, so another side. You mentioned that there's um with the mapping veterans, there are some profiles of uh Confederate soldiers, Irish Confederate soldiers. I know yeah. much of the website is de dedicated to kind of the Irish experience in the North and the Union Army, but I mean, just for people who might be interested in kind of that, that, um, that side, um, how much content yeah. is there about Irish Confederates on the website? You know. there, there's a good bit. There's a good bit. It, it's certainly, it's, it's grown less, I would say, as I've become more and more sucked in by the pension files. But there, there's a fair bit there. So, I mean, the best way, there's two ways of, of actually but rooting out articles on that site. There's an index um, page, which there's, a, there's over 600 articles on the site. So um, that's not including the resource pages, but they're all listed in the index page. Um, and that's, that's up on the toolbar. But one of the easiest ways is there's a search bar. So if you were to go and search, you can go and find them. But there's a, there's a good bit. Like I, I would have done quite a lot, particularly a few years ago on Patrick Claiborne who would be a, a, a very well-known um, Irish Confederate general, the highest ranking Irish man in the war. So I did a lot of work on him. So there's, there's for example, um, photographic explorations of the sites that are associated with him in Ireland um, as well. Um, and then there, there's, there's been different projects that I've gone down and I've looked at. Um, so for example, I did an analysis looking at, at um, 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 Confederate Irish colonels in the war and how many people they had or had not enslaved in ownership, um, just to look at that aspect of it, you know, because often um, that, that's one of the big topics of discussion from an Irish perspective um, in, in relation to how engaged were they in um, owning the enslaved. And of course, as we know, you did not have to own um, enslaved people to be, to be um, engaged in the, in the slave um, society, which Claiborne is a good example of that. So, so there's stuff like that. Um, so there, um, there, there's an aspect of the site that has to be updated because I did a lot of the early maps on um, Google heat maps, which were taken down. Um, but there was a, there's a, um, so I have to re-upload the information to a different area, but the base analysis is still there. So there's things like looking at Alabama Confederate Irish veterans their locations in Ireland and their locations in Alabama and based again on pension records. So I've looked at some of the pension records in the South as well. Um, there's, it, you know, the, the longest living Irish veteran of the American Civil War is a Confederate ca cavalryman called Jeremiah O'Brien, who was from Limerick. Um, and there's an, a look at him as well um, from, from 19, um, he died in 1950. So, so there's, yeah, there's significant kind of little bits and pieces of analysis spread across the site, looking at some units and things like that, and, and looking looking at some of the harder questions as well as the you know military history, if you like. Yeah, it's funny that you bring up that uh, Alabama heat map because, it's like I've mentioned before, I'm from Alabama, but the biggest heat bubble on that map is the part of Alabama that I'm from is like the Mobile kind of Mobile Bay area, which has this huge heat bubble. Yeah, okay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that the concentrations of Irish tend to be, I mean, they're always, um, the Irish in the, the, in the South are, are, are really intriguing, like particularly because, you know, you've got things like Memphis, um, where, where they effectively run Memphis during the, the Civil War, and obviously then are involved 
um, in the violence towards African Americans immediately after the war. Um, and they, they played a key role in, in, in that violence. But you, you, but you see it then um, in terms of, of where they're enlisting um, and how the, like Louisiana is the, the major state uh, uh, um, where they're, because of New Orleans, and that's where the Irish are concentrated, a place like there, a place like Savannah, and really heavily involved in all those locations. It's a fascinating story. Yeah. So um, just as kind of as we wrap things up here, um, and we've kind of talked about it in bits and pieces, but you actually do have a section on the website devoted just to the resources you can find, uh, you know, throughout the various yeah. tabs, et cetera. And I mean, it's, again, I can't say it enough. It's a mountain's worth of information available to people. It's almost, <laughs> I mean, it's just an it's it's almost like a digital archive. I mean, in a way that you have you know, newspapers, after action reports. Yeah, that, I mean, I, and that, that is kind of what I've, I've, I've tried to turn the site into. And it, like, I mean, there's, it's a life's work that I'd never finish now. So I mean, so for example, the after action reports, I need to do a lot more of them, but the, the idea is to try and build that. So, um, and just creating resources um, wherever I can. So. I'm, I'm a great fan for some reason of creating lists of things and Excel spreadsheets and stuff. I love doing this. <laughs> I've always loved doing this, but um, you know, so get, uh, so there's resources there that would gather information on Irish Americans who donated money to Ireland from the military in 1863 back to the relief of Ireland. Um, there's a section on newspaper articles where um, Irish Americans have written back for newspapers that are printed in Ireland, so Irish stuff. Again, I've tried to include some of them because they wouldn't necessarily be stuff that that um, scholars in the states might have easy access to, um, and 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 people who are interested it wouldn't be something that they would see. The bibliography is probably the one of the biggest things because it has all of that. There's a ongoing list of Medal of Honor recipients as well, which is also interesting because you would think that list would be nailed on and secured, but in fact it's wrong. You have um, I, there's been, I think during the work of the site, we've discovered two additional Medal of Honor recipients who, whose place of birth has been incorrectly listed as the United States when it was Ireland. Um, so that sort of list. Um, so there's just a, a lot of those different elements um, to try and help people who are interested in researching and looking for, for different aspects so they can go off and do their own um, work and analysis. Um, and a couple of you know, some of the posts are, are trying to show people how to do it themselves as well. So, yeah, it's increasingly become that type of an archive. Actually, just a, about six months ago, um, it was selected for the, our, the, our, the National Library of Ireland digital archives um, uh, have, are trying to capture kind of sites that they see as of archival um, use down the line. So they've actually just did that with, with this site so that they have a full kind of in, per, in perpetuity record of it for use in the National Library of Ireland as well. So that's, 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 kind, of, that's kind of one of the main um, things that I think it is now is that you could, because I can't remember what's on the site. It's my first step if I'm looking for something as I go and I try and search it on the site <laughs> because, uh, you know, if I, <laughs> it's, it's, it's too big now for me to remember what's on it. So. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll continue to be of use to people. Uh, so before we do just kind of like a, a, a quick, uh, just a, a walk through the webpage, uh, you've already mentioned a couple of things, but what's, what's kind of on the horizon for the website? What are the things that, you know, maybe you're working on getting uh, put into the website or things that you want to, to put in the website? Yeah, so the Andersonville one is 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 it continuing that. I mean, it's kind of dominated now for the last two or three months. I've always envis envisioned the Andersonville project as one half of a two-sided project, and the other half being Gettysburg. I've always wanted to do something similar with Gettysburg, and not just look at um, not just look at the North there, but Confederates. And I, I want to, I've had some tentative conversations about this and it'll probably be a long time happening, but the idea would be to not just ex, not just be looking at people who died, but a participation of Irish Americans. Um, I'm quite keen to try and explore actually plotting, um, plotting Irish American participation across the three days of the battle. Um, just to, you know, again, it's, it, it, it's, it's a tool that reminds us, for example, I, I, I've done work on 
Um, everybody knows the Irish Brigade in the wheat field, but the Irish Brigade didn't, weren't the unit that lost the most Irish in the wheat field. It was the regulars. There, there were more, more Irish casualties out of the regulars there. But people don't know that. They just know about the Irish Brigade in the wheat field. So that type of thing, you know, um, again, big Louisiana contingents going up place like Colts Hill and everything. So anyway, the, the, that's, that's something that I'm very keen to try and pursue. And I've had a number of conversations about doing that. Um, there's another project on the site that I'm keen to kind of drive forward again and give it a bit more of an oomph. Um, and that's the Widows in the Atlantic World project. So that, that started off as a, a mapping project. It's, it's plotted every widow or dependent parent in the world who was receiving a pension outside the United States in 1883. Um, and I had started, so I've, I've, I like that project because it's given me an opportunity to look at other people outside of the Irish as well. So I'm looking at British, German, um, Canadians, African Americans in Canada, um, that sort of thing. Um, that's, and that's kind of gone on the back burner a bit for the last six months. So I'm keen to kind of push forward with the Canadian element of that um, too on the site over the, over the next little while. Uh, great plans for for all of this when I have the time for it is another question altogether but um, they're kind of the major elements of the website that, that uh, I see advancing and I, I, I need to, to do things like um, update some of the things like the after action reports and the bibliography and stuff to keep it ticking over so that's kind of the main work Chase this is the home page then of, of the website but anybody who's looking to navigate is I mean I suppose the key elements are are up the top here um, the headline and resources and everything. We'll, we'll go through them in a bit, but the two that I find the most useful personally are just the search function here and, and the index. So um, I, a, a, a few months ago, decided, um, partially because I couldn't remember what was on the site, as you we were mentioned earlier on, but I wanted to index um, everything so that there was one area where you could look at it. So this page is a fairly large page that categorizes all of, these are all individual posts that you can look at. Um, and they're all categorized and organized in a way that enables people to access them. So there's the individual pages, um, articles that relate to battles or units, case studies. Um, I do a lot of work on cemeteries. So beyond Andersonville, anytime I'm in the States or anything, I, look at, I tend to go to national cemeteries and look at Irish Americans who are, who are interred there. And some Irish cemeteries looking at Americans of the war graves. Discussion and debate, so things like looking at questions, um, you know, in things like um, Irish um, interactions with African Americans, with Native Americans, that sort of stuff. Why Irish guys served, kind of these, these bigger questions. Um, I'm very fortunate to have some really excellent guest posters who contribute to the site. A lot of them are kind of regulars, so there's a guest post section. Letters and documents are kind of the meat and drink of the site, so dealing with with letters that um, I have uncovered in the archives, um, documents, and then discussing them. The micro history we're talking about, um, looking at the individual families and then telling that wider story based on them. And then just the military history, this stuff, the interactions with Native Americans and African Americans is of great interest to me. So there's a section on that. Um, pension files, then things like profiles of individuals, well-known individuals, um, transatlantic connections, so posts that specifically demonstrate a tie across the Atlantic, be it to Ireland or Britain or even mainland Europe. The visualizations and mapping, which we maybe might take a look at in a bit more detail. Um, and then we were talking earlier about things, how, how much of the site um, actually revolves around the experience of Irish American women, um, so women's history. So that's a good starting point for anyone who's looking for anything there. So the index and the search are your friend on the site. Um, but just to kind of run through it, um, the about is, is just about me, the site, the contact email and everything. The blog section itself is, is, the, is the kind of meat and drink of the site. Um, so there's been new content put up on the site every month. There's been new posts every month since it started in 2010. So these kind of show you the latest blog posts. You can see the focus on the Andersonville um, Andersonville work at the moment. So this is one of the features of that work is, is, is to take one individual grave as a spotlight and to examine that story. Um, and then um, other things, so like the pension building. So a look at the pension building in DC where so many Irish were involved. 
um, one of the guest posts here looking at the enlistment of three underage in, in, inmates in, in, um, in this, from the St. Louis House of Refuge. This is Brendan Hamilton, who's a, a, a long time um, guest poster on the site who's doing incredible work on looking at enlistments of uh, Union um, soldiers and sailors out of uh, houses of refuge, underage guys across the, the north. Really fascinating work. Um, so that's, that's kind of the blog pages. Um, looking at things like, looking at Paddy's Lament, very famous song that's used in gangs in New York and trying to find out if it was um, a Civil War song or not. That's the type of information um, that you get there. Uh, there is a kind of a, a irregular podcast that's attached to the site, I think you could say. It's, it's not, uh, it's not um, all the time. And it, it kind of crosses over to some other areas. I'm an archaeologist as well. So there's work on um, archaeological sites here. But um, this has elements um, of work um, that look at things like, you know, some of my talks are on here. People from East Limerick in the Civil War, the last les letters of Ulster immigrants in the Civil War, Ireland in the Medal of Honour. Um, some other elements I work on later periods as well. So um, the U.S. Navy entered the First World War um, from Cork Harbour, where I'm looking out on. This was their first active operational zone. And lots of Irish women married American sailors. So that's work that I conducted on, on that. So there's a few different things um, that you can get via the podcast. Um, the site also has um, a um, YouTube channel. Um, so that you, there, again, there's more resources there and things like there's talks and lectures. Again, some of it bleeds into other work I do related to things like Ireland's War of Independence. But there's clips, for example, from tours of the uh, First Bull Run battlefield, talking about the links from the First Bull, Bull Run battlefield uh, um, and things like that on there. Um, the resources one is a big one. So again, if you want to get at to the heart of the resources, this drop down list, and there's all these different areas. So there's a visualization. This is the books. So that's the full bibliography of Irish American writing books on the, the Civil War. The list of Medal of Honor. So biographies of everybody who, who achieved the rank of general or brevet general in the war. Uh, analysis of, of things like the Fetterman fight in Native American, looking at the Irish who, who were there. Uh, listings of Irish losses, the highest Irish losses by uh, in ethnic Irish regiments. This was the letters from America we were discussing um, in Irish newspapers. So letters written by serving um, servicemen back to home newspapers in Ireland. The donors to the Irish Relief Fund, which is a big listing of, uh, of these men who gave money in 1863 for the relief of Ireland when Ireland was on the brink of a famine. Um, after action reports, so some of the Confederate units in there, the 5th Confederate, which are kind of the, the regiment that have always interested me the most in, in, in Southern service. Um, and then regimental nativity, which is, uh, is looking at the places in Ireland where men from the 23rd and the 90th Illinois were from. But just to take a kind of a quick look, we were talking about visualizations there. Uh, this is a visualizations page that looks at some of the, 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 the things I've done there. So sometimes it's like a micro history. This is following an individual widow's story around uh, Manhattan, for example. This was, this is a, the part of Donegal my family are from when I decided to just go around North Donegal and look at links to the American Civil War from an Irish perspective. So we never tend to do that. We always think of it all in America. So this was looking um, at different sites, not all related to soldiers, but different sites that have a, have a, a link to the American Civil War. Um, there's the Donegal map, but things then like visualizing the desertion in, in the 63rd New York, looking at men in Europe who died um, um, in Andersonville. Um, these are the mapping that we've done. Um, and I have to thank my partner, Sarah Nealand, for doing all the, the, the this type of mapping. This is uh, areas where the 23rd Illinois were born in Ireland. Then maps of pensioners in Britain and Europe. That's the one we were talking about, Alabama, mapping the 63rd New York. So there's quite a lot of that type of digitization stuff. Uh, personal favorite of mine, the scarred men. So I went through 1863, July 1863, Naval Enlistment Rendezvous in New York. Um, the most popular... The most popular post ever written on the site is on the tattoos that those men had. The tattoos of the working class Irish. It gets far more reads than anything else. But the follow-on post from that was where they had the descriptions of them, where they were scarred. And so this is a visualization of 
where all the Irish Americans who enlisted in the Navy in New York in July in 63 had scars on their body. So again, I just enjoy that sort of, um, that sort of, 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 uh, of visualization. So I suppose then to kind of just, to just look at the, the, the three um, projects that are ongoing. So the Widows in the Atlantic World was the one that we just touched on at the very end, which is looking at all of these, um, these women and dependent parents who were receiving pensions outside of 1883. So this is them plotted. There's a couple of more, there's one in Brazil, um, there's one in Australia in 1883, but you can see this huge concentration in Germany, in Ireland and in Canada. Um, so quite a bit of work doing that uh, and then all the, the ancillary posts that relate to it that I'm hoping to go back to. So this doesn't just look at the Irish, a lot of them are Irish, but it has things like the visualization of the 1866 cholera outbreak, which looks at Irish, Germans and African Americans. This one that looks at widows in Scandinavia. Um, this is the, um, this podcast episode actually is the one I was discussing about um, Catherine Garvin whose son was stolen into the, um, into the army and was killed in the war. And again, looking at things like there's Corn, Cornish immigrants in the war, immigrants from the Isle of Man, the international pension crisis of 1893, when effectively um, all the widows and dependent parents' pensions were stopped in 1893 for a short period of time, just exploring that. Uh, mapping veterans then is, is the one we were discussing with Donegal. So this um, is the, the detailed map. Um, and you can go in and explore different elements of it. So the different symbols um, give you information about individuals. So if you, if you dive in, um, the ones with the crosses are men who died as a result of their service in the Civil War. So Edward Lachlan, um, 9th Massachusetts Infantry, and you can see where he dies <laughs> appropriately enough for what we're talking about. He dies in Andersonville. Um, so some very interesting stories. Um, I was discussing the man on Aaron Moore Island, uh, who is an Andersonville survivor. So there's two Aaron Moore men that we know served in the war. Obviously there were huge numbers more than this, but these are what we, we know. Paddy Gallagher, 38th Illinois Infantry, served in the Western Theatre and returned to Aaron Moore, died in 1920. Um, and I've stood in his house, or by, beside his house here on Aaron Moore, um, and the local community are very engaged in trying to have him um, appropriately remembered in their local cemetery. So. Um, different kind of elements of us with connections. So Cornelia Dare, uh, Glenvay Castle is probably the most famous um, park site in Donegal. It's a really famous stately home. And the wo woman who is famous there is Cornelia Adair. Um, and she is the daughter of General uh, James Wadsworth, who, who was killed in the war. And actually her sister was associated with a big house in Cork. So those type of connections as well. So not the direct um, a guy served there, but these other... Uh, other links. Um, and then I suppose to wrap it up, the Andersonville Irish project in itself, so it uh, gives the details um, of just the aims of the project, the contact details, how you can help. Um, and I'll come back to the, the map, the Ireland map, but this is the full database here. There's showing one to 10 of 225 entries and it's just listing the basics, um, the name, the unit, the company, their grave, and then what we know about them. So um, Monaghan, um, but even where guys, again, this doesn't just include Irish nativity, it's where it can be demonstrated that there were, that they were Irish Americans. So this man, James Brogan, whose father was Irish, he was born um, in Canada, Ontario spelled wrong. That'll be something I'll have to correct for my next update. Um, but these, the step migration through Canada here, um, really John Burke, Alex, no doubt to serve in the 69th New York of the Irish Brigade because he feels Irish, almost certainly. Um, and then sometimes right down to the very, these are what we call town lands in Ireland. These are units of designation in Ireland that are just effectively a few fields. So we can we know where that guy is precisely on Burns of the 13th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Um, so that's the, the first element of it. And then the map, again, where, where you, you can go in and you can explore um, individuals. So... Um, if we just dive down here, um, I am currently talking to you from exactly here. This is where I, uh, I'm I, in the house. So Middleton, an area where I do a lot of work. Um, 
And one of the contributions I got recently actually from Middleton, and I've done work on people from all of this area who work, who, who served in the Civil War, never came across this guy a couple of weeks ago, but Morris Hartness, who's in grave 6923 um, from Middleton, private company I, who died on the 26th of August, 1864. And so I, Make it. I'm endeavouring any time we get information that's contributed that it, it has an acknowledgement to the person um, who has who has given it. So again, Thomas McCarthy, who was on USS Housatonic um, from Ballyfeard in Kinsale, his widow never left here um, at this part of Cork, and she received her American widow's pension um, for Thomas's death um, in Cork until she died. Right. So. Um, I suppose that just gives you a, a, a bit of an overview of the different elements of the site. But definitely, I think if you did want to um, explore it, the index and the search are your friend, whether you would want to put in a state or a county or a unit or whatever you're looking for, that's the best way to find it. All right, Damien. Well, thank you so much for taking time today to talk to H Civil War about your website, uh, irishamericancivilwar.com. Um, so people who are just interested in Seeing what you're up to and what you're working on, where can they uh, where can they contact? Where they can, where can they find you on the internet at? Yeah, thanks, Chase. It was a great chat. Really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I suppose. Well, the site is probably the main one, um, and and if you want to contact me off that, it's Irish American Civil War at gmail .com is the best email. Um, I have lots of other websites that kind of touch on different aspects of 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 work I do on. Um, Irish battlefields and things, but th this is kind of the principal civil war one. But kind of the amalgam for all of them. Um, there's a, a Facebook page for Irish in the American Civil War as well. I should I should say, um, which you can check out um, if you type that into Facebook, and you can come join the community there. Um, and I suppose that the one I'm probably using the most at the moment in terms of interaction and things is Twitter. So um, I'm at at Irish ACW is my Twitter handle if anyone is interested there. Probably one of the best ways to contact me at the moment as well, actually, because <laughs> I'm pretty disastrous on many levels. But uh, yeah, so I suppose they're the main areas. Awesome. Um, uh, so you can also find um, a link to uh, IrishAmericanCivilWar.com through uh, HNet Civil War page under Digital Humanities, and you can also uh, find a link to this video under there. And so with that, uh, Damien, thanks again. I really appreciate it. This was fantastic. Um, and thanks, everybody, for watching.